Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's nice to see you all here. Um, I want to start by thanking Ellie Nuno and her group, uh, Two Cats and a Fiddle, and also Amy Martin for work down at the park. I don't, is Amy here? It's still pretty cold out there, I guess. Um, also, John Ingen, our mayor, who also spoke at the park. Thank John for doing that, and thanks to everyone for for coming. On a chilly day in early the early evening of April fourth, nineteen sixty eight, three men stood on the second floor balcony of the then segregated Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. As sunset approached, shots rang out from an assassin's gun and one of the three men lay dead. But his life, his dream, and his legacy forever changed the fabric of this country we call America. Soon after that tragic day, a plaque was placed in the room in which Dr. King was slain. On that plaque are the words, Behold, here comes the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. Forty years later, a young African-American man from Chicago stands poised to accept the mantle of the highest office in the land, that of President of these United States. The election of an African American to this position hails as a quantum leap in civil rights, a discernible note sounded in America's demonstrated desire to overcome bigotry and embrace racial equality. But in my estimation, this victory more so symbolizes a country's willingness to trust in the fundamental precepts which purport to define who we are. The, fund, the foundational statements espoused in the most sacred document, which in part puts forth the belief that all men are created equal. We all can now point to one instance in our collective recent history where America has demonstrated this belief. This current election also symbolizes a tangible victory over the politics of fear. We were told that a vote for Obama would be a vote for on-the-job training, that he's a nice guy but not qualified to make the big decisions, that he's tied to the radical left, that he's a Muslim, he's not really a citizen, he's not a real American, and on and on and on. Through it all, this country refused to succumb to politics of you, as usual. America sounded a resounding no to the politics of fear. Substantiated by this most recent election, today in America we are in some respects demonstrably less divided compared to the time when Martin Luther King walked this earth. Evidence of 
Bridging that gap is found in our realization of Martin's hope that one day we would live in a country where people were judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. However, it's also my belief that Martin would remind us not to confuse activity with accomplishment and not to lose ourselves in the belief that one step constitutes an entire journey. He would remind us that the work required by the road ahead should not and cannot rest on the shoulders of one man or one family. If we are supportive of these ideas and ideals, then we must assist in their coming to fruition. Barack Obama is a good man, no doubt. He's not Martin Luther King. Through his campaign, he has positioned himself as a politician with the capacity to understand the hard truths America must confront and to acknowledge the tremendous struggle it will take to unite Americans of all races to fulfill Dr. King's promise. Obama appears to understand the significance of this point and that he cautions us not to deify him. That belief marginalizes him and places him at arm's length from the average man. He too reminds us that although we currently face some of the most significant challenges to our collective national psyche in recent memory, we do so with a renewed optimism, a now present, long absent sense of hope. As Gary Hart points out, great presidents do not emerge from quiet times, they arise in times of chaos and crisis. Dr. King remind us, reminds us that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Dr. King realized the significance of the symbiotic necessities of our existence as individuals and how that translated into how we saw ourselves as a nation. We are truly now, more than ever, interdependent. Again, thank you all for showing up. I know it's a little bit cold out there. And uh, this year, we've kind of had people up in the, up in the rafters for, for one of the first times. So. Hello to you folks up there also. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started here. Um, we have child care downstairs if anyone has young kids and they're um, needing some uh, other direction elsewhere. <laughs> we have child care available downstairs. And if you look in your program, you'll find um, a little sheet of paper in there. And on this sheet of paper, we want you to, um, to write your ideas on how to fulfill the dream and address the new hope right here in Western Montana. Um, you can put them on this piece of paper and there's a bulletin board up back and we're gonna paste them on there. Also, if any of you are interested in participating in the work that we're doing throughout the year to bring uh, this event to Missoula, you're more than welcome to note that and we will get in touch with you and uh, we can definitely use your, your support. I wanna introduce uh, the pastor of St. Paul's Lutheran uh, Pastor Floor to give the invocation. Let us just take a moment of silence and of thanksgiving and of prayer. O oh God of all, with a wonderful diversity of languages and cultures, you have created all people in your image, and we offer our praise and our thanksgiving. Thank you for your work in us to bring us to a day that we can celebrate the unfolding of a dream in our nation, a dream not fully fulfilled, but a dream on its way. And we are grateful for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision and work that this year we as a people will have a president who is a person of color, a leader of hope, a leader for equality and justice. Continue that work in him and in all of us. And thank you, O oh Lord, and continue to work your will and your ways in our hearts and our hands and in our heads, unite us in bonds of love and service for all people, so that every person and nation may serve you in peace and justice. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Floor. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Cindy Weiss is the executive director of the YWC of Missoula. She's been involved with the Y for over the past 16 years and has been the director since 2001. Prior to taking the helm at the YWCA, Cindy served as the executive director of the Montana Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. She returned to the YWCA seven years ago and led the organization in designing and implementing its two hallmark initiatives, racial justice and economic advancement of women. The YWCA Missoula's Racial Justice Initiative was selected as a model hallmark program by the YWCA USA in 2007. And since that time, Cindy has traveled to the YWCAs across the country to share insights from the Missoula Initiative and encourage all the other YWCAs to do anti-racism work in predominantly white communities. Please join with me in welcoming Cindy Weiss. Oh, it's packed tonight. I've been coming to these for years, and I think this is our biggest crowd. Thank you. I want to begin by uh, thanking the planning committee for tonight's events and for all the events in past years. Um, I know that some of the committee members have been uh, organizing the rally for many, many years, and I just want to say I really appreciate your efforts. It is an honor for me to speak in tribute of a great visionary and on the eve of what will be one of the most historic events in our lifetime. I am truly humbled by the significance of this time, and I share my thoughts and words with you, fully aware that we all sit here tonight anticipating an extraordinary speech tomorrow morning. As Murray mentioned, I'm the director of the YWCA, a 150-year-old organization <clears throat> that works to eliminate racism and empower women. I am proud to be a part of an organization that has been doing this work for generations. I was born in the mid-60s, during the time of the most charged struggles of the civil rights movement. The 60s witnessed the rise of visionary leaders like Martin Luther King, Bobby and John F. Kennedy, and the courage of everyday people like Rosa Parks and the 250,000 people who joined the March on Washington. But it was also a time of great loss and shattered dreams. Two years before I was born, our nation lost JFK. Within six days of my birth, Malcolm X was assassinated. And when I was three years old, Martin Luther King and then Bobby Kennedy were taken from us. So perhaps it is no coincidence that I had developed a strong sense of justice at an early age, or that I've spent the last 16 years working for an organization like the YWCA. You know, there was a time during Dr. King's life when there were just three places in our nation's capital where a black person could be served a meal, and two of them were YWCAs. This year, we have traveled light years from those days, but our work is not done. Tonight, we honor an inspirational leader who forged a path for the leaders of today. And I think all of us would agree that 2008 was an incredible year. Record numbers of us were swept up by the energy and enthusiasm that surrounded the election. From teenagers to 100-year-old great-grandmothers, Caucasians and American Indians, gay people and straight people, the rich and the poor, we all could feel that we were on the verge of a profound shift in this country. And I must confess before I go on that during the primary season, Kelly's laughing over there because she knows why I'm going to confess, I was an ardent Hillary supporter. <laughs> Never before had I been so excited about a candidate 
or volunteered more hours or given more money to a campaign. For me, her candidacy represented a dream I'd had since childhood. And when she lost the primary, I was heartbroken. But despite those feelings, I was moved to tears on November 4th when Barack Obama was elected president. Watching the results come in that evening with a small group of friends, I couldn't help but think that America was being reborn. And the election didn't end racism, but it signaled that there is a real possibility to build justice for all in our lifetime. I believe that we are not now obligated, each one of us, to do our part to ensure that this opportunity doesn't fade in the face of apathy or resistance to change. As a white woman, I feel a unique responsibility to be an ally to people of color and to interrupt the racism that is sure to rear its ugly head as more people of color assume leadership positions in the wake of the barrier-breaking election of a black president. And so tonight, I speak specifically to the white people in this room. And I invite all of you to join me in doing five things. First, we must recognize that racism hurts white people, not like the damage it inflicts on people of color. But it corrupts our humanity, it erodes our integrity, and it undermines our sense of self-worth and goodness. It also keeps us separated from the lives of a rich variety of people, and it alienates us from other white people who we deem to be white racists or maybe white liberals. Secondly, we all must work to end our own racism. From the time we are young children, we are exposed to a constant barrage of racist messages and practices from family and friends, in the media and our schools, and in many institutions. And no one can grow up in such a society and escape its effects. As white people, we have to actively work to unlearn our racism. And to do so requires sometimes painful honesty and the willingness to listen to and believe the experiences of people of color, even when it feels like criticism. The third thing that we must do is understand that the election of Barack Obama has not ended racism. It may be tempting for white people to now think that race doesn't matter anymore. But to believe that would be to ignore the fact that white people still have significant advantages compared to people of color when it comes to employment and education, health care, access to justice, and political representation. Fourth, it is imperative that we develop a mindfulness of racism. As white people, we have the privilege of not noticing racism if we don't want to pay attention to it. Unlike people of color, we aren't always going to feel it when we walk in a room. We have to learn to look for it in ourselves and in the institutions that operate in our community. Missoulians live in a 94% white community, and so it would be easy to ignore the effects of racism, but all we have to do is talk to our Indian friends and colleagues to know that it impacts their lives every day in our city. And finally, we have to support the leadership of people of color. And we must do this consistently, but not uncritically. With our first black president, we mustn't expect more from him than we would a, a white president, nor should we demand less from him by ignoring mistakes or missteps by his administration just because we are afraid to criticize him. Dismantling racism requires much effort and authenticity. So I want to close tonight by thanking all of you for coming out on this frigid January night to celebrate Martin Luther King, Jr. 
there, I don't believe there's been a more fitting time to honor Dr. King, who laid the foundation for what we all will witness tomorrow morning on the steps of the nation's capital. And for that, we owe him a mountain of gratitude. And finally, I also want to pay tribute tonight to the enslaved and free black men who built the White House 200 years ago, and to the enslaved men and women who staffed it for 60 years after it was built. These slaves would not have imagined that one day a black family would occupy that great house and lead our country in its rebirth. I hope that their spirits may rejoice tomorrow. Thank you.
when I when I walked in today, uh, a couple of members of my committee that are that are still here were discussing me downstairs in the kitchen before I got here. I should say that three of our members are fortunate enough to be at the inauguration. So uh, we miss them and uh, hope that they are well. But anyway, I walked in and uh, Betty, Linda, and who else was it? Betty and Linda, for sure. Maybe Kelly. Or saying, Murray, you never smile. <laughs> well, Betty, I'm smiling now because I'm kind of taking over and doing something different. So. And I know how much that kind of gets you a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> One of the important things, I think, is we come and we gather here uh, year after year, and a lot of times we don't know the person sitting next to us. So in between now and our next speaker, I want to take two minutes, two minutes only, I want everybody here to get up and meet somebody you don't know. Two minutes starting now. Stand up. <laughs> T minus 35 seconds and counting. This is so much like Missoula, you get you going and you can't stop. So. That feel good? Yeah. All right. Our next speaker is Mike Beers. Mike Beers has been performing as a stand-up comic for four years. He started out doing small gigs at Open Mic in Missoula, in the Missoula area. Uh, no glasses, sorry. Um, getting stage time between hundreds of college bands you've probably never heard of and whose members will probably become accountants once they sober up after college. <laughs> he then graduated to more glam. Does anybody have any uh, cheaters? Can I borrow a pair of cheaters? Come on, there's a lot of old people and I know somebody has cheaters. <laughs> you want me to start over? Yeah. I'm not going to. No. no, I won't. Mike Beers has been performing as a stand-up comic for four years. He started out doing small gigs at open mics in the Missoula area, getting stage time between hundreds of college bands you've probably never heard of, and whose members will probably become accountants once they sober up after college. He then graduated to more glamorous gigs, playing mostly his own family reunions and some very lucrative performances at retirement homes, <laughs> which were his first paying jobs as a comic, two cookies and a glass of milk. A large portion of Michael's act is based on his own life growing up in Montana with his mother and three sisters, their dog, and a disability. He also ventures into some social and political commentary. Michael is currently traveling around the country performing mostly at conferences. He won the Norman G. Brooks Comedy Competition at the Hollywood Improv in 2005 and was the winner of the 2003 Brick Wall Amateur Comedy Competition in Spokane, Washington. 
His humor cashes in on the subtlety of everyday life. Mike's comedy is surprisingly insightful and good natured, enough to leave any audience feeling lighthearted with a new perspective on life. Mr. Mike Beers. Stadium seated, don't expect a standing ovation every time you pause. <laughs> so that's a lot of work. I gotta put my sandwich down, I gotta put it over here, I gotta stand up, I gotta grab my movie again. But uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, you know, I have a, a fairly unique story. Um, and I, uh, I, uh, I work at Summit Independent Living Center. Um, I don't know how many people know uh, what that is or where we are, but uh, we work a lot around uh, civil rights for people with disabilities and independent living for people with disabilities who live independently in the community. Um, and it's just a fairly new, it's a fairly new world for me. Um, but I will say, I will tell you um, that I grew up. I was uh, in Montana. Um, one of the questions I like to answer right off the bat. Because most people have it. What's wrong with his hand? <laughs> and when I was a younger man, I used, I, used to, I used to say things like, you know, I ignore the do not feed the bear sign at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe I was conceived under power lines. <laughs> and like when my little cousins come over, I like to say, yeah, don't worry. I didn't eat my vegetables either. <laughs> cousin only ate broccoli for a month. <laughs> but she still has all her fingers. So. There might be some reason for that. But, um, you know, no, I was born with it. Um, what does I like to call it? Mini hand. <laughs> and I remember this one time, I'll tell you guys this quick story. I remember one time, I was 10 years old, um, and I was shopping downtown Missoula with my mother. And I looked up at some point, and I saw a sign, like a beacon of hope, said, Second Hand Store. <laughs> I thought, yes, find me a store that has what I need. 
So I ran in there and I went up to the counter and I said, I want one. <laughs> the guy looked at me like I was nuts. He said, you want an old lamp, a brass booty or something? I said, no, sir. I would like a second hand. <laughs> and he still looked confused, so I spelled it out for him. I said, listen, I have the first one. All I need from you is the second one. You have anything in the right <laughs> that I could try on? And then he laughed and took me out of the store. Uh, no, but it wasn't, you know, it's not all I joke. It's not all funny games. Having a hand like mine. Um, you notice I'm not wearing any laces on my shoes. Um, and it, we have come a long way. Like, I feel like an old man when I talk to disabled kids today. Because I'm like, you don't know how lucky you have it. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I couldn't always get good looking shoes when I was a kid. If I wanted accessible Velcro shoes when I was in middle school, I had to like special order them from the AARP Fall Collection. <laughs> <laughs> and it was rough, because at that point in time, they only came in two colors, brown and, and not quite as brown. <laughs> And I remember, like, trying to fit in, you know, in school. And I remember one day, I, came, I showed up first day of school. Everybody was wearing high tops. We liked to pump. But they were all, like, the end thing to do was not to tie your laces. Everybody remember this craze? And I got really excited. I was like, Mom, I can buy normal shoes. No one else is tired either. And then she said, no, you can't. I spent eighty dollars on those Velcro shoes. <laughs> You're wearing them till the Velcro runs out. <laughs> so I did what I, I did the only thing I could think to do. So I went to school the next day and I unstrapped my Velcro shoes. <laughs> and I walked around like that. They said that Velcro is really strong and it attracted like clumps of hair. <laughs> and <gum wrappers. laughs> One day I accidentally brought my cat to school. <laughs> it's awkward. <laughs> Why not? And I will say, um, in these, you know, in looking back at my life, um, we all learned about civil rights and the civil rights movement in school um, as something, you know, that was part of history and impacted a lot of people. And it wasn't until later on in high school, and, and especially after, after high school, that I really began to look at how those movements had affected my life and allowed me to be where I'm at today. Um, and I think back to uh, my very first day of uh, school. You know, you turn five years old, everybody, you know, you, you sign up for kindergarten at five. That's the protocol. You know, and my mom, my parents took me to the office and they said, you know, they went to sign me up for school. And, because that was a thing to do. But they, the, the administrator at the time took one look at me and my parents. And without knowing us, said, he doesn't belong here. He belongs in a special school. You know, or he needs to homeschool him. He needs to be around people like him. And my mother, did not get angry at this man. My mother, who I have since found out is a quarter Jedi, <laughs> looked at this man and said, my son is going to your school. <laughs> and the guy looked back at my mom and said, your son is coming to my school. <laughs> So it was a struggle just to get me into a public school. And this was 1987, you know. So, you know, and I say that because, you know, learning my history, learning the history of our country, you know, I, I, I've heard of Brown versus Board of Education. And I've heard what it did, what it opened the doors for other people. But it wasn't until, you know, very recently that, you know, I found out what that did to me. That, 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 that case opened the doors for me and anyone else with a disability to be in public schools and not to be segregated from the, the rest of our peers. Um, but I always had a hard time in school even after that. You know, 
with assumptions. People, people will make assumptions based on what you look like. We all know that. You know, and I always remember in grade school, because there was always that like, awkward first conversation with my new teacher, because they come up the first day and say, Hello, how are you doing? And being five years old, I didn't know that I was being patronized. So I assumed that she had a disability. <laughs> like a slow talking disability. So I said, I'm okay. How are you? I remember teachers were always willing to make accommodations for me. You just assume I needed to help with certain things. I remember one time we had our assignment was to do a book report on 300 pages and turn it in in two weeks. And the teacher took me aside, unprompted, and said, Mike, you just hand something in. I said, okay. <laughs> two weeks went by, I turned in a very nice book report on Where's Waldo? It had one sentence, I found him under the bridge. <laughs> and you know what the messed up part is? I got a B. <laughs> but now, like I mentioned, um, another, another part of my story um, that, that I like to celebrate and uh, to share with people um, is the, the, my family. Uh, my bio mentions I grew up with three sisters. Um, so, but the thing that it doesn't mention is that we were all adopted. Um, the four of us were adopted from different families. And that, that's, that's something different in itself. You know, it's not like growing up in, in you know, quote unquote, traditional households, whatever that is. Um, I, I, remember, I remember, you know, asking, it was a very hallmark moment, I asked my father, I said, Dad, where do babies come from? And he sat me down on his knee and he said, Mike, when two people love each other, they hope and they pray, and one night during dinner, the phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, really? He said, yeah, the phone rang, and we picked you up in 30 minutes or less. <laughs> Next time the phone rang during dinner, I said, hey, Dad, order a boy. <laughs> and being an opposite, um, we always knew that we were adopted. You know, it was never a secret. Um, and later on in life, um, it's a long story, but um, eventually I met both, both sides of my birth family. Um, and that's when, and I knew growing up that I was Native American. It was black feet and But I never knew anything about the culture or my heritage. So when I met my birth family, I began to know that part of myself you know, that I had, didn't have access to otherwise. And I began to realize that in order to start fighting, you know, things like racism and ignorance, and part of that is just sharing our collective story. But the thing about it that I found interesting is that none of those stories appeared in my history books. So, look, the things I took to be fact, I started to get kicked out of class for laughing at them. I remember on Columbus Day, I read Columbus Day, they say, Columbus discovered the new world, and he was a hero. And then I'd laugh <laughs> and get kicked out of class. <laughs> and I knew two things. Columbus, all right, Columbus didn't find anything that was new. Okay, and just FYI, if you ever walk in somewhere, and, someone's, and there's someone there to greet you? <laughs> it's probably not new. <laughs> That'd be like me walking into Walmart and when the guy in the blue vest says, welcome, we say no. <laughs> this is my store. <laughs> I just found it. Where do you keep the corn? <laughs> and Columbus, 
Columbus was lost when he found America. He was looking for India. He was so lost, he didn't even know that he was lost. He, when he landed in America, I'm not making this up, when he landed in America, he thought he was in India. That's why we're called Indians today, because he's talking to somewhere else. If this is India, those must be Indians. Can you imagine if he was looking for something simple, like the post office? <laughs> the whole tribes of mailmen just roaming the plane. <laughs> Little shorts, big socks. <laughs> but they didn't get one thing right in the history books. They always write. And this is what surprised me that they got it so correct. Um, all the John Wayne movies got it right. When, Native, when Columbus landed, Native people did say how. It's 100% true, they said how. Except they edited out the last part, which was how. Long you think you're going to stay. <laughs> but no, and, and I mentioned, um, you know, I mentioned where I work with some independent living. Um, and the independent living and the disability rights movement is something I discovered right out of high school. Um, I had no idea that, you know, I knew what my disability meant to me and who I was. But I didn't know that there was a disability history or a culture, uh, much less a movement. Uh, and I had no idea who those people, like I mentioned before, all those people that have worked in civil rights, you know, that allowed me to be where I am. I had no idea who those people were. Um, and, and since, you know, I graduated, what, seven years ago, um, you know, that's really added to my life. And I've really began to learn that, that history and culture. And find out very much that disability is a lot like being part of any other minority group. And you have to deal with a certain level of ignorance on behalf of people that just don't know any better. Um, I, I can pretty much guarantee that not all people, but a lot of people will assume two things right away when they see me. A, I can't hear you. <laughs> like, I was standing, this is a true story, I was standing in line at Taco Bell a month ago, and uh, this, this guy, about my age, college age guy, he, he started pointing. He said, oh my God, look at his hand. That's messed up. And then he called his friend over. He's like, Tommy, put the burrito down. You gotta see this. And that's when I started doing stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and when I get real deep into it, I drool. You know, just because that's what he expects. And uh, when the other thing people assume I can't do anything on my own, like two or three times a month, I have somebody come up yelling. Can I help you with that? You want some help? I was like, no. I've used the urinal before. <laughs> Thanks for offering. Uh, but I don't get, you know, like I said, I don't get angry. Um, what I've come to realize is that eight out of 10 people that are scared and myself or anyone with a disability, it's not because, in, in, it's because they're curious. You know, and you have to look at yourself, and this is where people may disagree with me, but staring is natural. Staring is a natural part of life. When you're sitting at a restaurant, what do you do to every person that walks in that door? You stare. If I see somebody with 18 piercings in their face, I'm gonna stare. But, the thing is, the thing that's inherently wrong is making assumptions based on the reason that you stared at that person. You know, the stare at yourself is not inherently wrong. Um, but what I've started doing for myself, um, just, you know, as a hobby, I stare at able-bodied people. <laughs> like, if I'm not working, I'm in the Kmart checkout line like this. And when, I, and when I'm with my family, I hide behind my mom's leg when I do it. <laughs> She's always 
like Mike, don't stare. You know, I know they're different, don't stare. <laughs> and uh, people are constantly coming up to me and they'll ask me, they'll ask me, Mike, what should we call you? Like, Excuse me? Uh, yeah, what should we call you? Handicapped, crippled, gimp, disabled? You know, what's the, the politically correct term? I always like this thing. It's person with a disability. That's the best term to use. <laughs> or Mike. <laughs> I, um, I would like to thank you guys once again for having me here. Um, it's a very humbling um, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here and to speak to you guys for this event. Um, and I'd just like to echo what Cindy said. Um, one of the things I have learned about the civil rights movement is that, and, and this is what I learned from my heroes, like Martin Luther King Jr. and Justin Dark, who, uh, for those of you who don't know, was very big in passing a lot of uh, <laughs> Uh, a, lot of, a lot of civil rights bills pertaining to people with disabilities. Um, but what I learned from these two gentlemen and a lot more people is that, you know, we have, we have our issues. You know, I have people with disability. You know, you may, your, your thing might be women's issues or gay and lesbian issues or African American issues. But at the end of the day, civil rights is an all or nothing proposition. Um, so we all have to be there for each other. thank both our speakers for two extremely inspirational speeches. Mike, I can, I can appreciate a couple of things that, that you talked about. And uh, from my own experience, I'm, I'm not a little guy, and I know that. Um, it used to bug me when I first got here that people did stare. But at some point, you have to come to that realization that you came to that staring's OK. It's just thinking beyond that point and assuming something or presuming something is where the difficulty comes in, and I can appreciate that. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, excuse me. I thought it said imbue children, but it says introduce children <laughs> who are reading the winning entries. For those of you don't, who don't know, we have an essay contest, and in years past we've had an art contest for uh, three grades, for uh, grammar school, I guess elementary school, um, middle school, and high school. And tonight we want to announce those winners. This year, uh, the pot was sweetened to some degree in that uh, each of the age groups had a single winner who will receive $100. So we'll start with uh, grades three to five, and the winner there is Tyler Hazeltine. Is Tyler here?
I can make a difference by treating people the same, even if they are physically challenged, mentally challenged, or even a different race. One person can make a difference. However, he can't do it alone. Martin Luther King wants us not to judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now we have recently elected a black president. We need to hope we elected him for the content of his character. All people are equal and no one is better than anyone because of the color of their skin. Your words can have a permanent effect on life. Remember, you have no limit on how to help. I think Martin Luther King would be happy with the effect he made today. <laughs> Our next winner through from grades six through eight is Kelly Seitz. Am I pronouncing that right, Kelly? Lastly, our uh, ninth through twelfth winner is Amanda Satterley. When we're able to look at someone without labeling or stereotyping them is when we will truly be able to say that we're looking at them for who they are. We need to look. We need to look past the person's physical appearance and look at their inner character. We have come a long way in 40 years, but we can do better. We must join together and lovingly correct our peers when they degrade others. We need to stand united and deal with discrimination consistently. Racism isn't inherited, it's taught. Using derogatory words, whether joking or serious, is unacceptable. Will we see the day when we look back and say, wow, we were really ridiculous for judging someone based on their I shape, gender, or do not a pigment in their skin. Replace racism with looking at individuals for their own individual uniqueness, admiring that they're not another cookie cutter person. <coughs> Appearance and character are two different things. We are all human. Anyone can make a difference. And anyone can make a stand and speak out against racism. Robert F. Kennedy said, each time man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from the moment different centers of energy, and during those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest of oppression and resistance. That ripple has started and is waiting for you to carry it on. Don't let it fade.
Can we give them all another round of applause, please? Can I get the ushers to the side, please? Um, those of you who've been here before are familiar with this. We are a nonprofit organization, and everything we do, we do through donations. All the things that uh, we're able to, to do through the course of the year um, is by the gifts of folks like yourself. So we have uh, some ushers here that are going to pass around the hat. Ellie's going to play, her group's going to play a little bit more, and we'll do that. Can I get the uh, committee members to stand up, please, the ones that are here? <laughs> Standing back in the corner is Dr. George Price from the University of Montana. I know that Betty and uh, Betty Wing is, is here as well as Kelly Slattery and um, um, Ms. Olson, and I, I don't see either of those guys. They must be downstairs working right now. There are refreshments downstairs. There's uh, soups and refreshments and conversation available for you downstairs at the close of today's program, just so you know that. Um, a couple little housekeeping things in closing here. Uh, we want to thank um, the sponsors uh, for, for the refreshments, the Good Food Store, University of Montana Catering, Great Harvest Bread Company, and the, uh, and the YWCA. And our sponsors also include Missoula Advocates for Human Rights, 
the UM Excellence Fund, St. Paul Lutheran Church, the YWCA, Hyde and Soul, and the University Congregational Church. Without the efforts of all those folks and you, we, we couldn't be doing this today. Um, there, is, there are several other programs going on the rest of the month uh, at the university. Uh, there's a community uh, rally in March. That's happening today, actually. Uh, on Thursday, the 29th, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Celebration speaker is Erwin F. Gelman. He's the Allegrin Chair of Modern History, American History Emeritus at Chapman College, and he'll be speaking on King, Kennedy, Nixon, and the election of 1960. And then on February 2nd, the Pres President's Lecture Series uh, presents Anel Prim. She's the Director of Minority and National Affairs, the American Psychiatric Association, and Associ Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and Mental Health Matters for the Nation in Montana will be uh, the topic there. And finally, there's a film, Red, White, and Black and Blue, Race, Culture, and Mental Health in America. That's going to be presented at, at 8 p.m. I was handed a um, small flyer uh, relative to the fourth annual Labor Film Festival and the Workers' Rights Group. And the person who handed me correctly pointed out that Dr. King um, had a lot to do with labor and union groups. Uh, the website there is www.missoula-labor.info. Um, also want to make sure that we um, thank our ushers here. Can we give them a hand, please? And I've got uh, just one last thing that, that I want to I want to read to you, um, and it, it's from the words of Poet Laureate Maya Angelou and her impressions on the importance of Dr. King's lesson on civic responsibility to all of us, in particular to, to young people. Ms. Angelou says that the effect of a great man or woman is not always visible. That is to say that the very fact that we are having this conversation, that there are thousands of young men and women around the country discussing and thinking about Martin Luther King is evidence that his impact has reached you as well as me and the hundreds of millions of people. What it will mean, I pray, is that out of this kind of discussion and the various celebrations you will have and you have had, out of these celebrations there will come an idea which may have its birth in your mind. And you may decide to make life better just for one minute and just in the place where you are. So if you don't think of having to be grown up and having to have power and money and prestige and name and all that, if you don't believe that that's the only way that you can make a difference, you can be important. Then you can start right now just where you are, there in Missoula, being a better person, being kinder, being more courteous, trying to be a better student so that you will make an impact on yourself, your nation, your race, your gender, and in fact on the world. This is how his impact can be seen, you see. So it's not, it's not just for people who are well-known and big and all that. The impact is seen on the one young woman in Missoula, Montana. That's where we see the impact of Dr. Martin Luther King. In closing, I want to thank all of you, in particular the young folks here, for your dedication to making this country a better place. We're acting on the belief that civil rights come with some civil responsibilities. You are the living, functional representation of the legacy of Dr. King and all those who seek peace and justice through active service. It is to you whom Dr. King spoke of when he said, the hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and to brotherhood. Ellie, you want to take us out? In your program, the two songs are going to be led again.
something else that we do a song tonight, and this brings to mind something that we all have in common. We have a little light, and we should always try to keep it on through the darkness. And we've never done this song before, but oh yes, we've all sung it, I'm sure. This little light of mine. Let's find a key to sing it. 